Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here. We want to welcome everybody uh, to the forum and to the Harvard Kennedy School uh, for tonight's important discussion. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a speech followed by a discussion and then questions from the audience. Uh, the moderator, the person in charge of the, the entire evening, is Farah Pandath. Farah has been an IOP fellow uh, for this past semester. Unfortunately, her fellowship's winding down, uh, so we're going to be sorry to see her go in a few weeks. Um, she has a unique position of being a political appointee in both the Bush and Obama administrations and was a special representative to the Muslim communities uh, in the Department of State in the Obama administration. Uh, and we're really glad to have you tonight, and we've been glad to have you for the whole semester. So please join me in welcoming Farah. So good evening to everyone. I'm really happy you're here. This is a, a delight and pleasure to have a chance to talk about a really important subject on a really emotional day. Uh, I actually really want to thank uh, Lisa for coming. She's a friend, but she also serves in, in an incredible, uh, in incredible way for our government. And it's, a, it's an area that I've worked on for many years, as many of you know. But Lisa is doing something right now at a moment in time in our nation's history that is ever evolving. And today's conversation is going to be about that. Um, many of you have seen the bio that is in your program today, but I want to highlight a couple of things for you. Not only welcome home Lisa, because you are here uh, on your home soil, I should say, in many ways, but also um, because uh, in this room you have students, both undergrads and graduate students, who look to you in your role and as a person who graduated from Harvard as someone that they can be uh, look at as a role model, and, and I really want to thank you for coming. Um, Lisa has, is right now the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security uh, and Counterterrorism. She's also the Deputy National Security Advisor. Uh, you will know and see in the program that she served in a wide variety of ways at, at the FBI, uh, which is really important for us as we frame these events um, because it's both, both domestic and global. Uh, she also was a federal prosecutor, which is really important uh, in, in a multitude of ways, but one of the things that I thought was so important about her background was that she served on the Enron Task Force, which is very interesting. Uh, so uh, DOJ had gave her the highest award it can give, uh, and as someone who is a public servant, as someone who has spent her career working for our country, uh, we're honored to have you here, we're delighted to hear what you have to say, and we're looking forward to the conversation. So Lisa, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Farah, and um, it is great to be back. Uh, it's great to be back in Cambridge, it's great to be uh, here at Kennedy School, uh, and it's particularly nice to be out of Washington. So. Um, I want to thank you all for welcoming me, and particularly thank you to Farah for your very kind introduction uh, and for your service, uh, your service to our country as the first special representative to Muslim communities during your tenure at the State Department. And uh, I think, I'll just uh, betray my prejudice here, I think more importantly, as a leading advocate uh, for a community of voices to counter extremism and it's something we'll talk about tonight. I want to thank everyone at the Kennedy School for doing so much to develop our future public servants and political leaders. I'm honored uh, to be with you today and to be part of the great forum tradition. I attended these uh, periodically uh, when I was milling around Harvard Square as a student and wandering uh, away from coffee shops and into the forum, and so it's really nice, uh, it's really nice to be back. And I want to thank um, uh, Deputy Secretary Ali Mayorkas, U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz, and the rest of the members of the panel who will be with us today. We're here today because of a tragedy. This morning, uh, I joined Vice President Biden at the memorial service, marking the anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings, marking one year since we were shocked by those truly awful images at the finish line. One year since we lost Crystal Campbell, Lingzi Liu, eight-year-old Martin Richard, and Officer Sean Collier. All innocent lives, all lost much, much too soon. It's been one year, though, since we saw how Boston responds in the face of terrorism, with resilience, with resolve, and with unbending strength. When the bombs went off, uh, 
I had been uh, President Obama's chief advisor on homeland security and counterterrorism for just a few weeks. It was uh, a deeply personal introduction to the demands of my current job. I was, as has been mentioned, uh, raised just a few miles from here in Newton. I went to high school in the shadow of Fenway Park and then made the not so long trek down Storrow Drive uh, to college here. Growing up, I spent every Patriot's Day lining the marathon route, usually uh, standing with my brothers just at the crest of Heartbreak Hill, cheering on runners and uh, taking part in what was not only a day off from school for us, but really a great, great Boston tradition. And last year, my twin brother was there in the crowd alongside thousands of other Bostonians. So it was not only an attack on our homeland, it was an attack on my hometown, our hometown. Now we've faced violent expressions of extremism throughout our history, including 19 years ago today, uh, not today, but this week rather, in Oklahoma City. Sadly, we continue to face it, as we saw just two days ago in Overland Park, Kansas, when a gunman, allegedly a white supremacist with a long history of racist and anti-Semitic behavior, opened fire at a Jewish community center and a retirement home, killing three Americans. And while the American people continue to stand united against hatred and violence, the unfortunate truth is extremist groups will continue targeting vulnerable populations in an effort to promote their murderous ideology. And that's why stemming domestic radicalization to violence has been a key element of our counterterrorism strategy really from day one. President Obama has been laser focused on making sure we use all the elements of our national power to protect Americans, including developing the first ever government-wide strategy to prevent violent extremism in the United States. At the same time, we recognize that there are limits to what the federal government to do, can do, rather. And it's not often you get somebody from the federal government who acknowledges that there are limits to what the federal government can do, but it's true. So we've got to rely on partnerships, partnerships of those who are most familiar with local risks uh, and those who are in the best position to take action, and that's local communities. Local communities are the most powerful tool we've got. They're the best asset we have in the struggle against violence and against violent extremism. Now, it's interesting because we've crunched the data on this. In more than 80% of cases involving homegrown violent extremists, people in the community, whether they were peers or family members or authority figures like teachers or even strangers, these people had observed warning signs that a person was becoming radicalized to violence. But more than half of those community members downplayed or dismissed their observations without intervening. So it's not that the clues weren't there, it's that they weren't understood. They weren't understood well enough to be seen as indicators of a problem. So what kinds of behaviors are we talking about? For the most part, they're not related directly to actually plotting attacks. They're more subtle. Parents might see uh, sudden personality changes in their children at home, uh, becoming more confrontational than usual. Religious leaders might notice unexpected clashes over ideological differences. And teachers might hear students expressing an interest to travel to a conflict zone uh, overseas or friends might notice a new interest in watching or sharing violent material. The government is, of course, rarely in a position to observe these early signals. So we need to do more to help communities and community members understand the warning signs and then work together to intervene before something can occur. While always, and this is important, while always respecting our core commitment to protecting privacy and civil liberties. All of this is for naught if we don't have the trust in our communities 
um, between both the government uh, and the members of the community. And during the past uh, several years, that's what we've attempted to do, to build these partnerships. We've built partnerships and expanded our engagement with communities across the nation, especially those that may be targeted by extremist groups. We're working to improve our understanding of how and why people are drawn to violence. And we've made it a priority to uphold and defend the qualities from which we draw our strength that make us communities our openness, our diversity, and our respect for the equal rights that all Americans share. Because we know, all of us, all too well, that Muslim American, Sikh American, Arab American communities and others, including Jewish Americans and others, have been victimized by violence. Violence that is rooted in ignorance, in prejudice, in suspicion and fear. American Muslims and Americans of all faiths have enriched our way of life, contributing to our safety and security as patriotic service members, police, firefighters, first responders. Violent extremism is not unique to any one faith. And as Americans, we reject violence regardless of our faith. Here in the Bay State, uh, over the past decade, Government and law enforcement officials have built a dialogue to reinforce that shared commitment to nonviolence and to build trust with a range of Boston area communities. The local U.S. Attorney's Office brings together representatives from both federal agencies and the federal family, along with community leaders, some of whom I had the great privilege uh, and the great opportunity to just uh, have a discussion with. And I can tell you, from my point of view, the benefits go both ways. Law enforcement is better able to understand the specific challenges facing communities, different communities. And community participants can bring their concerns directly to the government, but only when there is a relationship of trust, only when um, people can trust that something uh, will be dealt with in a way that is respectful, respectful of individuals, respectful of communities, uh, and respectful of faith. Because we all care about keeping our families and our neighborhoods safe. And it's these common connections that were so critical in the chaotic days after the bombing. They helped to minimize the potential for backlash against Muslim and Sikh communities in particular. For instance, in Malden, after a local Muslim woman was assaulted, purportedly in retribution for the bombings, the Department of Justice and its Community Relations Service worked with local officials to request additional security for the local mosque. And it was the Malden police chief who personally stood watch that first night. But despite the broader security improvements we put in place since September 11th, despite our outreach to reduce the risk of radicalization to violence, more work remains. We need a comprehensive prevention model, one that allows us to work with communities and to intervene with at-risk individuals before violent extremism takes root. And we need to meet the evolving challenge, including terrorist use of the internet to recruit those who are the most vulnerable to violent extremist ideologies whether it be from neo-Nazis or groups like Al-Qaeda. So today, we honor the memory of all those who were killed and injured one year ago. We, re we recommit ourselves to building greater resilience in our communities to resist the pull of violent extremism. We will continue to work closely with community leaders and local law enforcement and partners outside government who work with at-risk populations every day faith leaders, school teachers, police chiefs, and especially mothers and fathers and families. These are the people who will always be the best positioned to identify individuals in a community who might be susceptible to radical messages and to violence, and to help them resist these ideologies. So we must do more to connect those leaders to resources they need to be part of a comprehensive approach to be part of a community approach. 
So let me just spend uh, a minute or two describing uh, some of the things uh, we'll be doing. First, the Department of Homeland Security is building partnerships with key cities across the country to establish a locally based envoy dedicated to coordinating government engagement on the threat of homegrown violent extremism. This, pilot, this uh, program was piloted in Los Angeles, and this effort has already helped focus our resources and strategic efforts by streamlining federal, state, and local outreach. Tonight, I'm very proud to announce that the next such uh, Department of Homeland Security envoy will be based right here in Boston. Second, the Department of Homeland Security is also going to make more resources available to officials who are countering violent extremism right in their communities. Every year, DHS offers hundreds of millions of dollars in grant money to local law enforcement to bolster homeland security at the municipal and county level. And it's important work. But now, in addition to preparing to respond to an attack once it's happened, state and local officials can apply for these grants to explicitly develop models for preventing violent extremism in their communities, drawing on expertise from social service providers, education uh, administrators, mental health professionals, and religious leaders. And finally, I think it's important to mention the expertise that's developing right here uh, in your own backyard. With the support of the Department of Justice, uh, the Children's Hospital here in Boston is studying why, for instance, some Somali refugees embrace violent extremism while others move towards gangs and crime and still others channel their energies into nonviolent activism. The answers to these kinds of questions will be essential to developing more effective models to intervene. And here at Harvard, of course, the Berkman Center is establishing a new research network dedicated to understanding and ultimately to preventing radicalization to violence on the internet. Hate speech and extremism take on complex and new dimensions and dangers when conducted online. And this will be a valuable asset as we strive to identify more effective ways to intervene and to address extremism in the internet age. During the past year, Boston has been a crucible of sorts for our nationwide efforts to counter violent extremism and to enhance our resilience. The bombings brought into very sharp relief what we've been doing well and where we still need to hone our efforts. The programs that are operating here set the examples for cities across the nation. And uh, as a daughter of Boston, I say this with absolutely no surprise whatsoever. The strength of the people of Boston made it, and I must say, wicked clear <laughs> that this city and this country cannot be intimidated by the ideologies of hatred and violence that poison the hearts of a few disturbed individuals. We reject that thinking. And when people gather next Monday in numbers as great and as proud as ever to celebrate the running of the 118th Boston Marathon, it will also show that we reject the fear terrorism seeks to breed. It will show the true depth of what it means to be Boston strong. Thank you very much. Okay, we're changing the stage. Now it's, now it's the panel time. Uh, so I'm going to be a panelist as well as a moderator, so you're going to have to forgive me. And I've been asked to uh, frame the issue for you about what CVE is. What is countering violent extremism? How did we move into this framework uh, in a post-9-11 world? Um, what, are we, what are we thinking about these issues from both the government side and from a partnership side? And then we're going to open it up to all of you to ask questions of our guests, and I will moderate that portion. Um, you obviously have just heard uh, from, from Ms. Monaco in terms of 
who she is and what she does and what she believes. That was a wonderful speech, thank you. But please join me in welcoming the rest of the panel. Uh, to my left is Reverend Brown, who has done incredible work over 20 years uh, in prevention of gang violence, and I want to thank you very much for being here. We also have, further down, um, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, um, Deputy Secretary Mayorkas, thank you for joining thank us. You. Uh, and my friend, Harris Tarrin, uh, who is here from Washington as well, uh, who serves as the Washington lead for the Muslim Public Affairs uh, Council. So thank you all for being here. So let's, let's frame this issue so we can have a good conversation. Um, in a post 9-11 world, when we thought about extremism and countering the threat of terrorists and extremist ideology, we were not thinking uh, about terrorist organizations per se, we were thinking about things that happen in communities. And I think it's very interesting that the arc has sort of shifted. But from a government point of view, after our country was attacked, we, in, when I was in government, began to think a lot with the Department of Homeland Security that had just been developed, by the way, a brand new entity in the United States government, with the intel communities, including new organizations that were built, the National Counterterrorism Center, for example, uh, the Department of State, uh, and other uh, departments and agencies across the federal government in terms of how we think about a threat of extremist ideology. Now, let's be clear. Um, as Ms. Monaco said, extremists are not only in the form of what you see on the news all day, every day. It's not just about Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. It's also, unfortunately, about other kinds of extremists that live in our world, from Mumbai to Oslo, from Kansas to Boston. Extremism exists in a multitude of ways and in ways that we haven't always understood. But what's happened over the course of the last decade and a few years is that our government has spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, not just from protecting the homeland and, and, and making sure that we understand what's happening at a community level and a national level, but under, also understanding how people get radicalized, what's taking place along the way, what's happening online and what's happening offline. And I'm here to tell you that having been in this for the last decade, things have changed a lot. They have manifested in ways that we have not even predicted and understood. Um, they will continue to manifest. But what Ms. Monaco said at the end of her speech was really important, that we are Boston strong here today. But that idea of resilience, that idea of how we empower ourselves, this idea that government can't do it alone, is a really important frame to put on this conversation. Because right after 9-11, the immediate response was, what is government going to do? That it's government's solution. Certainly, there's a very powerful role that government must play. But what we absolutely know in terms of countering violent extremist ideology is that the most credible voices are the, vo the voices that can push back against extremist ideology. And the most credible voices are not government. Mm -hmm. The most credible voices on this planet, this is obviously not just here in America, are those people that live in communities that have a voice that makes a difference. Who are credible voices? Well, they can be musicians and poets, they can be preachers, they can be students, they can be teachers. They can be all kinds of people. But what government has learned over the course of the last decade is to find credible voices of all shapes and sizes, to understand how we can partner with them and how we can build resilient communities, not just here in Boston, but all around the world. So with that frame in terms of the conversation today, I do wanna just pick up on a couple of things that you talked about, Lisa. Um, you've been working on these issues for a really long time and, and you spent uh, a lot of time thinking about the evolution of, of these issues. Can you go back to the time when you were serving uh, with Janet Reno and how you thought about the issues then and what, how, have, how have things evolved from your perspective? Well, thank you, Farah, and I think it was a very helpful frame and I'm glad now we've switched to calling me Lisa because I didn't recognize who we were talking about before <laughs> when we were referencing Miss Monaco. But, um, you know, thinking about this, and as you mentioned, I've been um, kind of uh, working with these issues um, uh, for a number of years now. And um, I think back uh, to 1998 when I joined the Justice Department as a uh, baby lawyer then. Um, and uh, it was right after Oklahoma City. Um, and we talked about, the language was different. We talked about domestic preparedness. Yeah. 
um, and it was about responding um, to uh, a tragedy uh, like that. Uh, and we, the, the language was about domestic preparedness. We hadn't, uh, we hadn't really um, confronted the question of intelligence and information sharing and a lot of the issues that have come to the fore now. But one of the things uh, that we did do and that I learned across my um, uh, career, both in law enforcement and as a prosecutor, uh, and in working on national security issues now for a number of years, is this, uh, this thing that you picked up on, this notion of a community approach, that it can't just be the government. Um, and I think one of the things we're trying to do and that we've learned over time is uh, to use models that we've developed in other settings, whether it's community policing, uh, whether it's how to uh, divert uh, and give uh, at-risk uh, communities, at-risk youths, uh, other options, other ways to, to fill their time in a productive way, uh, to show other role models in the community, whether it's coaches, teachers, uh, religious leaders and religious figures, other charismatic figures who can draw uh, at-risk individuals uh, in a direction away from a path of violence away from expressing their um, their fear and their and their disgruntlement uh, in a violent way, um, and so I think what we've learned over time is that we should use some of those models where we call upon some of those more trusted individuals, and that has worked uh, in the past, whether it's community policing or other things. Um, the other thing I think we've learned, and I hope we continue to do, is to make it very clear. Disagreement with a policy, disagreement with an issue, uh, domestic, foreign, you name it, that's not extremism. That is not something to be feared, to be shied away from, to be marginalized. It's something, it's what makes us better. Disagreement and discussion and discourse uh, and speaking up uh, and that there's a way to do that uh, and that we should welcome that and not label it as extremist. So um, thank you for that. And, and when we think about the, the role of communities and what we've learned and how we have many tools in the toolbox, one of the things, too, that I think we have seen very, uh, very carefully is sort of what demographic we're looking at. And what I mean by that is sort of the youth. Um, and in the 21st century, uh, young people are using new tools. Um, how are we thinking about that? And what have you seen in an online space that keeps you up at night? Well, there's a lot about the online space that keeps me up at night, whether it's a cyber um, attack or a cyber intrusion, or the increasing uh, prolific use of and availability of uh, the internet to uh, radicalize and to have individuals uh, in places, um, whether it's in their basement or in a cafe, um, or in, in an area um, that a teacher or a parent doesn't know uh, it's happening. Uh, the ability and the ubiquitous uh, nature of uh, the online space and, and our ability uh, to uh, receive information and to have uh, young people receive information that um, can uh, radicalize uh, is, is a real concern. So we have to think about ways to uh, other models that we've used uh, in the online space, whether it's um, uh, to combat sexual predators right. online um, uh, and other models that we have um, come at uh, and other threats that we faced online uh, to address uh, the internet uh, being used as a radicalization tool. So it's really, it, it's uh, been a, a brand new sort of field, if you will, uh, as we've watched this evolve and have the bad guys become far more sophisticated in how they target young people, how they use the internet to, to make a difference in, in a wide variety of ways. But um, one of the things that has been very problematic is that when people are looking at things online, they're doing it on their phone or they're doing it on their computer, and it's a very isolating kind of thing. You're not exposing a lot of other people to what it is you're seeing. Um, and so what you said in your speech was really important about family, about mothers and fathers, about sisters and brothers, watching people begin to change and change the shape of who they are and how they think about things. And when things are happening in an online way, family doesn't always see that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, as we look at the online space, are we doing a better job of sort of articulating to others what it is we've seen? Because 
think tanks and, um, and community leaders, as well as government, have done a lot of research uh, in this area. You named some, some uh, stats in, in your speech. But are people more aware of what's happening so that they're more prepared, if you will? No, I think it's, I think we've got a lot more to do. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that some of, um, uh, some of the tools uh, that those who would radicalize others to violence, um, some of the tools that are being used are specifically targeted at youth. They're particularly targeted at consumers of um, internet media, um, whether it's a, a hip hop uh, rap right. video or song um, that has a radicalizing or violent message, uh, whether it's uh, the use of um, uh, media and kind of glossy magazines uh, to extol uh, things like the marathon bombings. Um, these are things that uh, I fear we can become inured to, right. and that's a real danger and less our communities, and less uh, the figures who are trusted and can be trusted um, are, are watching that and are mindful of that. I have a colleague who, um, until his kids get to a certain age, only wants them to have access to their internet in the living room so that they can um, uh, share that um, experience as a family and that there isn't an isolated space. And so these are some of the things that our, uh, our community members, our authority figures, our trusted um, figures to, uh, to our young people, I think, uh, need to be employing. Thank you. Um, Deputy Secretary, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to switch gears just slightly because I think that the role that you had before this one is actually really interesting. And uh, for those of you who have not read his bio, uh, he was in charge of the U.S. Citizenship and Nat Immigration Services, which is the part of our government that um, is responsible for, facil for facilitating the naturalization process. So in 2014, our country has record numbers of refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, along with all the other things that we're dealing with in this, in this cauldron of uh, creativity in our country right now. How do you balance um, working to, uh, to welcome uh, these, these communities but be vig vigilant within, these commu uh, within our homeland to keep us safe and to understand what the threats are? So thank you for the opportunity. L let me um, answer that question succinctly and then expound sure. upon my answer a little bit. Uh, the succinct answer is uh, by adhering to our laws and defending the principles that they are designed to serve. Uh, the laws uh, provide for eligibility uh, requirements and the like, and we have uh, well-defined laws that speak of uh, our identity as a nation, as a nation of immigrants. It was very interesting when I arrived at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in late 2009 uh, I was sometimes asked explicitly and certainly uh, often implicitly the question, uh, am I pro-immigrant or am I pro-national security? And it's such a false paradigm because the two can coexist and must coexist perfectly well. That we can be a welcoming and embracing nation and it is in fact our historic commitment uh, uh, to be that and to continue to be that while at the same time ensuring that those who are not eligible for whatever the reason, whether it be a national security reason or otherwise, are not admitted into the United States. And, and the responsibility of leadership and of those who govern is to ensure that the people who administer our immigration laws understand and execute that responsibility. Thank you. Um, one other question for you before we move to our community um, panelists. Uh, I, I, look, I was at the White House I've served at the State Department. I've watched the Department of Homeland Security grow and evolve in a wide variety of ways. And I'm really proud of the work that you all have done in terms of many things, but also reaching out to community and understanding the power of community. That's the way Lisa framed it uh, in her speech. Can you talk to us about what you're doing to engage with communities from the Department of Homeland Security point of view? Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, Lisa uh, very powerfully spoke to that in, in her remarks and, and spoke of our plans to uh, to increase our engagement uh, with the community. Uh, homeland security is a shared responsibility. It is not a government responsibility. It is not just the responsibility of the individuals in this room. I think it is a responsibility uh, of all individuals throughout our country. And uh, that is something that the department has recognized and has executed upon. And I think 
uh, needs to and intends to and will execute, execute upon more vigorously. Uh, envoys uh, into the community so that we uh, bridge any divide that exists between uh, our Department of Homeland Security and the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, we have a very active Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, a very active Office of Privacy uh, that help ensure uh, that the highest uh, standards uh, of government uh, are realized, that our values are kept very much intact and are uppermost uh, in our uh, minds as we safeguard uh, our interests. So let me jump in for a second and, and tell you from my point of view, um, one of the things that has been very inspirational to me in terms of how our government has thought about the use of community, the optic of Department of Homeland Security is not always an easy one for communities. It's, it's hard. Um, and even though there is an Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties that is doing their best to, to work on, uh, on, on these conversations in a comfortable way, it's not always easy. It's emotional. Uh, it's hard for a lot of people to process. One of the things that has been wonderful is the breadth uh, and the components to these engagement exercises, if you will. Not only are you doing round tables, but you're going into communities and pulling uh, out a lot of different uh, actors that have not just been the, the traditional players. And that idea of going deep and going wide is powerful. Because if you only go to the people who say that they represent the community, you will miss a lot of people. So you have been able to do that. Um, and not just in terms of religious groups, but in terms of those, uh, those constituencies that make up a full community uh, and can talk about and process. And the word you didn't use, but I want to use, is you all listen. You have done a lot of listening over the course of the last many years, and I feel very proud about that. Um, as someone who watched this evolve, we didn't always get it right. We're in a, we're in a, good, in, we're in a good direction. So uh, I, I am putting a plug for DHS, but I mean it <laughs> because I, I, worked, I worked these issues even though I wasn't at DHS, and I know how hard that's been. Reverend Brown, you've had an incredible history of getting into the community and working on gang violence. Um, I have been inspired by the work that you've done uh, here in the Boston area. Uh, your work nationally, you're recognized for the kind of approach you've taken, but you are talking with uncommon actors and you're putting them together, law enforcement, clergy, faith actors, communities. How does that go? What are you doing and how are you doing it so well? A lot of prayer. <laughs> um, Good answer. I, I, I think for the most part, what you said just a minute ago about listening is a really critical component. And it started in the relationship that we had with the young people themselves, the gang members, the drug dealers. When we, as clergy, started to come out of the four walls of our sanctuary and meeting the youth where they were. And we did an enormous thing for uh, ministers. We listened rather than preach, you know, which can be a hard <laughs> thing sometimes. But in doing that, we were able to come to an understanding that a community consists of many voices. And it's when, when a person has a voice that is not being heard, I mean, that's where the seeds of discord can begin. Yes. And when they feel like they're being heard, you can pull it all together. Same thing with law enforcement. Uh, we had conversations with, with uh, gang unit officers about the streets and about the families that we were working with. They were trying to do their community policing better, and we were trying to do some outreach so that we can reduce the violence, and we found a way to come in sync. And when it goes to the uh, DA's office or the uh, state attorney's office and um, uh, our U.S. attorneys, we were able to pull together a series of meetings with young people where we can be united on the premise that we want to see violence reduced in the community, but we also want to see their lives become better as well. So the radicalization to gang violence is similar to some of the stuff that I've worked on in, in, mm -hmm. other, in other places. And, and communities of clergy are really, really important because mm -hmm. they can speak to issues in a way that a layman cannot. Sure. Um, but how do you build respect between law enforcement and clergy and vice versa? Um, because things aren't always easy. Yeah. Well, you have to do it on the ground. You can't do it in a series of meetings in which you come together every week and just sort of talk. Uh, you know, uh, in the sky about various issues. You have to be on the ground talking about the work that's, ha that, that's going on. And the clergy themselves have to be on the ground interacting with the youth on a regular basis so that they can understand the community and all its ups and downs. You were talking about the internet yeah. and, uh, and how, and, and social media has just sort of 
transform community, you know. So it's an amazing thing to talk to uh, young people on the street. And as we're talking, they're looking at their phones and referencing right. information, you know, around what we're talking about. I mean, it's a whole new world. And we have to understand that as well. And I will say that you've been pioneering um, your work online in mm -hmm. gang violence. And uh, really reading about the work that you've done has made me think about what I've seen internationally in terms of gang violence. And, um, and I'm hoping that you can share some of your best practices, not only with the domestic audience, but with an international one, because you've done this on the ground and you've learned what the new millennials are, are dealing with uh, in, in, a, in a way that's very powerful for all of us to think about in terms of pushing back. Let me transition to Horace um, and, and ask you, first of all, congratulations on your piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that program um, called Safe Spaces. But one of the things you said in the Wall Street Journal article was that we've been doing it the same old way. We've got to do something different. What's different? What are you doing? Tell us. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I think the first thing that we have to understand that Lisa mentioned, you mentioned as well, Farah, is that government is limited in what it can do. Right. Government can help set policy, correct policy, but it can't get into local communities and understand the minds of people. And so what this program is, uh, is designed to do is really facilitate best practices on how communities can engage on the issue of violent extremism. There's no one path to violent extremism. It can be, it's, it, it varies from individual to individual. And so what we've realized is that, you know, I always say CVE, countering violent extremism, is not a dinner table conversation in the American Muslim community, nor should it become a dinner table conversation. American Muslims care about what, what every other American cares about. That's the mortgage, you know, the child's tuition, everything else that they have to deal with on a daily basis. But the toolkit is designed to give community leaders, youth pastors, imams, people at the grass tops level who engage these individuals on a daily basis or online um, in student groups to really understand the signs that you mentioned and where, where then they can intervene. Because a lot of what we've done, and this is a different, what, what we've done is we've identified an individual that might be at risk or that's heading towards a path of violence. And we've used the tool in a t law enforcement toolkit, which is to essentially arrest that individual, arrest our way out of this. And the president in his strategy in 2011 says that that, that can't be the only answer. We've got to dig deeper. And so what we say is we need to start intervening. There's the prevention part that communities can do really well, but then we need to start intervening. We need to, we need to train parents on detecting those signs. Right. We need to uh, teach peers to have these conversations. And the reason we call it safe spaces is we need to create safe spaces so that individuals, especially young people, can feel comfortable talking about grievances. If I have an issue with a government policy, either domestic or foreign, I shouldn't be spooked about talking about it. I should feel comfortable. That is the epitome of patriotism and citizenship in our nation. And I should feel comfortable talking about it and disagreeing with, with that policy as long as, I, as long as I do it in a constructive manner. And that's, that's the, essentially the, the, the framework of this toolkit, is to give communities those safe spaces. So I, I applaud MPAC for taking this on. I will say, when I was at the NSC, uh, right after the Danish cartoon crisis, and we were beginning to talk to groups in America who uh, were organizations like MPAC um, about how you build resilience within the community. Uh, there was a lot of pushback uh, on countering violent extremism, on CVE. They didn't want to touch it. How did MPAC all of a sudden start to move in that way? And I only say that I applaud yeah, yeah. you for the effort, obviously. But um, did, you, did you see what was happening in Britain? Did you see the, the experience of those kinds of programs in Britain and decide we need to do it here? How did that evolve? So I think there was definite evolution. Uh, you know, there was this, this, this notion that it happened, it was happening in Europe, it was happening in the Middle East, but we were immune because we had economically, we had socially integrated and economically integrated. But I think the internet really shifted that dynamic. Uh, the internet and what we call them, you know, there's dope dealers, we call them idea dealers. People who come online and will will put out a very simple narrative of the world, of our religion, and of our communities, and of policies. That it's us versus them. And what we've realized that we need to do is put out that counter-narrative. 
that counter narrative that it's more complex. Right. When when you when you know when someone is trying to recruit you to go somewhere out, you know, in, in some part of the world, it's not nice and dandy. There's complexities. And and so what we you know, it was that evolution that did take place. And so it is important for us to put out that counter narrative because we understand that this is not a in terms of numbers, it's not a huge issue for the American Muslim community. Overwhelmingly, the American Muslim community is, is well integrated socially, economically, and getting civically and politically integrated. We understand it's a few individuals, but those few individuals have a huge impact on our well-being yep. as a nation and as a community. And so that's why right after the, you know, the Boston Marathon bombings last year, we said we need to start engaging these individuals. And so we brought together imams, we brought together former extremists who had gone down the path, and we started to interview them, engage them, and it's taken us a, a year, but what we've realized is that we need to take control of the narrative. We're not, gonna, you know, we're not doing this because government wants us to do this. When we go into community and say, so why are you doing this? Are you doing this because the FBI wants you to do this? No, we're doing this because it's our civic and faith responsibility. And I will say that the most successful models of countering the narrative are not only credible voices, right. but the idea that you can cede a lot of counter narratives to the narrative of extremists. And so that there isn't only one way to do it. There are many different counter narratives all pushing back against violent extremism, mm -hmm. but the size and the shape, the person who's executing that vision of what that counter narrative is looks different. Looks different. Mm -hmm. um, while we're, um, I wanna ask one other question, but I will open it up to the floor. So as people come to the mics, there are two up there and two down here. Let me, um, let me just ask one thing, Horace, to you, and, sure. and just to sort of frame this before we get to the Q&A. Um, the American Muslim community is the most diverse group of Muslims anywhere in the world, right. okay? Um, I wanna know how it is that, I know, but I would like them to know, uh, <laughs> how is it that different sects different ethnicities, different, uh, different kind of belief systems within the Muslim community can be cohesive and push back against violent extremism in this country when in many countries around the world they have not been able to do so. Mm. So, you know, what we, when, when people ask this question, we say it's unity of purpose, not necessarily unity of, of institution. We understand that, the, you know, according to Pew, American Muslims, like you said, are the most diverse religious community. But one thing that they all have in common, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, um, Muslim communities who've been here for hundreds of years, the African American Muslim community, or it's more recent immigrant communities, they all want to prosper and do well. And they have a shared sense of their faith being a positive factor in their life and their citizenship being a positive factor in their life. And I think so when we talk to all these diverse communities, I mean, I was just on the phone before I came here uh, with, a, with Somali American leaders. They are really interested in addressing this issue. Um, you know, uh, folks from North Africa, the Middle East, everyone has this sense of they want their children to live in a better America, and they want their faith to be seen as a contributing factor to this nation, not as a fifth column, not as a suspect community, they want to be seen as partners and full Americans as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start over here. Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Boston on today of all days. And I'm, I don't just mean the weather. Um, I'd like to explore the question of trust because what you're talking about the government doing is going into communities um, that are, you know, understandably. Um, less trusting of government. And then I'd like to, to ask it in this sort of specific way. Um, what you've described is really a thimbleful of the government, you know, counterterrorism and counter extremist activities. Um, I mean, after 9-11, vast amounts of resources were spent in, you know, collecting and connecting dots. Um, and we've had, you know, what's really a natural experiment, a tragic natural experiment you know, here in Cambridge where um, there was somebody, um, you know, taking the path to extremism, yeah. um, you know, leaving dots behind, um, and they were not connected. Um, why should we trust any program coming out of a, a government department that has, you know, 
set strategy and has failed at it. Sir, and could you just identify yourself, please? Oh, I'm Saul Tannenbaum. I'm a local blogger. Thank you, sir. Lisa, um, sure, if you want to take that. Um, well, you know, you, you raised the issue of trust, and we spent a lot of time um, on this stage talking about it. But um, it, to my mind, um, more importantly, with uh, a number of, of folks in the community uh, representing a whole host of views right before we came out on stage. And the, uh, I think if we had a count, um, the word trust was the most off-stated yeah. word uh, in that room off to the side. Um, and, you know, I'm, I can't sum up the discussion, but um, to my mind, what I said in there was the reason I think we need to build trust is twofold. Uh, from my perspective and from my job, um, one is public safety and security. Uh, and it is very important to have the trust of community members uh, in order to do my job better and to do the job of government, which is at, at its core uh, is to work on behalf of people. Um, but also to provide the kind of safe space that Harris talked about, the kind of safe kind of channel of communication so that communities that are themselves victims of violence and prejudice, whether it's Muslim communities, whether it's other communities uh, of other faiths or other um, uh, backgrounds, uh, for those community members to come forward to the government who are the only ones who can act on that information to keep them safe. Um, it's got to go two ways, and you're not going to have that relationship, that safe space, without some measure of trust. Reverend Brown, can you speak to the issue of trust? This is what you do all day, every day, is build trust. Absolutely. Can you, can you respond? I mean, it, it, trust is not something that is automatically taken as soon as you, you know, get in the room and meet. It has to be built. It has to be a level of give and take. And it also has to evolve in a kind of understanding of each other you know, as individuals. What we're trying to do in building trust is to eliminate the sense of otherness that occurs. And when, once that is eliminated, then you have the seed of, of really building some genuine trust that will move the community forward. Rachel, go ahead. Um, I'm Can you kindly bring the, I thank you. Please introduce yourself and ask a question. My name is Rachel. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and my question is about the radicalization process. So once individuals have already gotten relatively far down the radicalization process, what programs does the government have in place to de-radicalize these individuals? And if this is not something that the government is actively involved in and is done mostly at a community level, how does the government support the right kinds of de-radicalization programs in this country? Great question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'll, I'll take a stab, and uh, maybe my colleagues would want to. But um, you know, de-radicalization um, is a very charged word, and I think we, we could all pour into it any number of things. Um, I think uh, the one of the things we're trying very hard to work on and that I think we've all talked about here is engagement, further engagement across not just from a security perspective, but uh, from a whole host of uh, areas across the community, educators, uh, health professionals, um, religious leaders. Um, it is only in having that greater dialogue and having that greater engagement that you might identify these folks who are further down the path to radicalization. Um, and it's about education, in my view, and what the Reverend talked about. If you um, can talk and give an outlet for grievances, as Harris referenced, maybe in, that, in doing that, you can try and steer somebody uh, from uh, the path to violence. Uh, but I don't have a silver bullet on de-radicalization. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe that could be something for your graduate studies. The deputy secretary. If I can, um, and, and I might not be uh, able to um, stop myself from adding something to the prior question as well. Um, uh, the, the federal government actually devotes a considerable amount of resources to uh, supporting community efforts um, in addressing uh, uh, particular individuals or particular phenomena in those communities. Because after all, radicalization occurs in a particular place, and it is that particular place in the community, the neighborhood, the people uh, there who are best equipped to address it. And so we as a federal government support those efforts, whether it's through formal grant programs, uh, envoys, or the myriad of ways that we partner 
uh, with communities. So I think that we have structures in place and efforts uh, both in place and planned, uh, as Lisa addressed in her opening remarks. If I can on the issue of trust, I, I do think there's one important uh, message. Uh, first of all, uh, distrust, as, I, as we mentioned in, uh, around the table with uh, members of the community here, distrust is often earned, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and uh, we eliminate distrust uh, by action. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and trust, uh, to the Reverend's point, is earned as well, and it takes, it takes time. And we create a space uh, for trust by listening, and I think it's very important to be open uh, to developing that trust. Thank you, and Horace, you wanted to, there are yeah. lots of questions, so we wanna, yeah. Just, just quickly, I mean, we've got this beautiful document that brings us all together. It's called the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the, the great thing about our country is that, is that having even radical ideas is not illegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the great principles of our nation were built on radical ideas um, that were once radical that kind of, it's when those radical ideas move towards illegal action and violence. And we believe, what we've outlined is that government has a very specific role to play. It's not in that radicalization process. It's if a person commit, is, is committing or getting close to committing an act of violence, government steps in and engages and you know, takes action. But communities have to develop the tools to find out where those ideas where a person goes wrong and where those ideas start to kind of, um, you know, come out into open and engage. And that's why we've, you know, and, and what we've proposed in the Safe Spaces Initiative is this idea of creating crisis inquiry teams where you have a pastor, an imam, a religious leader. You have, you have counselors. Um, you have family members. You have people who can help an individual intervene. And we don't use the word de-radicalization or radicalization. We like to use the word intervene. You intervene and you rehabilitate that individual. We haven't really you know, developed a great model in this country of, of rehabilitation. There's been attempts in the Middle East and in Europe, but what we have to try to develop is communities have to develop models of rehabilitation. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go up to the balcony. Um, yes, please, <coughs> please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Zoe Simon. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, my question is directed to both Ms. Monaco and Ms. Padik. Um, as a woman in politics, both of you truly are role models for a woman like myself. Um, and my question is, do you have any advice, I guess, for young women who do seek to enter politics? Is there anything you've learned in your time? I did not stage that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got pretty simple advice. Do what you love. Um, be true to your convictions, uh, and focus on the job you have. The work will speak for itself. I really can't say much more than that. That was amazing. But I will also say um, that in the field of national security, there are far too few women. And if you are interested in entering that field, I urge you to jump in with both feet. Um, it is really hard to sit around a table and be uh, a voice of a community when there's only one gender that is represented. So um, think about that, if that's your passion. Uh, if it's not your passion, jump in anyway, right? <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Let um, me, let yes, me, if please. I can, uh, yes. say one thing, um, uh, just for the record, that uh, these two women are not uh, role models only for women. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. very kind. That's thank, right. thank you. Okay. Please introduce yourself. My name is Alex Loomis. I'm a research assistant here at the Kennedy School. One of the issues that led to decreased trust with the Muslim community after 9-11 was local police officers and FBI agents uh, surreptitiously uh, infiltrating, might be a loaded term, but that's a decently good description of it, uh, Muslim groups. Previously, there had been privacy restrictions and uh, First Amendment restrictions preventing them from doing this uh, in religious groups and political groups unless they were following up any specific criminal investigation. My question is, should they be allowed to do this for the purpose of gathering intelligence alone? So, um, I know that you need to leave for a flight very soon and we are going to wrap up because we're at 7.07, but would you like to take a, the first stab at that answer? So I, I will say uh, it, it harkens back to um, a point I made earlier that um, a distrust is usually earned. I, I, when I said that, uh, I did not have that particular practice in mind. I had a, a different policy, 
in mind with respect to the screening of individuals uh, uh, who, who are travelers. And uh, uh, it was not a very refined process. Um, in the immediate aftermath uh, of 9-11, I, I think that uh, perhaps all of the practices that the government employed uh, were not necessarily uh, the best practices in keeping with our highest values. But I think what happens is the government matures and the government reforms and the government improves in its practices. And we become um, uh, more surgical and more fact-based uh, in our decisions uh, when to employ our resources uh, to ensure that we're all uh, safe. And so I think we've grown as a government since then. Would anybody else like to comment on that issue? Okay, I'm gonna give the last question to Max because he is in my study group and I'm taking the privilege of being moderator. I'm so That's sorry. not fair. I know, I know, but life isn't, right? Max, please, fair. jump in. Um, hi, uh, my name is Max, I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, we've been discussing these issues of countering violent extremism uh, all semester in, in uh, Ferris study group. And I think something that uh, we've talked about a lot is the power of language. Um, and my question is, uh, how does the U.S. government uh, go about impacting the rhetoric surrounding uh, the us versus them uh, narrative? Great. So, open to the floor. Anyone who wants to take the question? Well, I'll Please. jump right in on that. Um, and we had some discussion about this, actually. Um, were some of you um, sitting in the back at the, that room? Um, the, I come down on the side of us. Uh, us because we are all Americans. Um, and whether it's coming from any number of different faiths or any, uh, any number of different backgrounds, it can't be us versus them. It's gotta be all us. The president said that too, right. as you know. Um, we are at 710. Um, please join me in welcoming, um, <laughs> welcoming, thanking this wonderful <laughs> panel um, and welcoming actually many new guests to the, to the forum is what I wanted to say um, this week. We have a lot of other forum events as well, and I urge you to take a look at the Kennedy School calendar to come back and take part. Today was very special. It was very emotional for, for a lot of us uh, here in Boston today, but you asked great questions, and I feel really honored to be part of this panel. So thank you all very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you.